It's good to be here. I'm sitting um, outside of Philadelphia um, uh, in uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Um, my wife and I have been spending extended time with our son and his family that moved back from Tel Aviv here. But uh, anyhow, it's also uh, a burden to be near Philadelphia and see they're doing the playoffs of, in baseball and the Yankees are in uh, the Bronx with their playoffs. I'd rather be in the Bronx during playoff season than in Philadelphia. But uh, Lord have mercy, mercy on me. Um, it's a blessing to be with you all. I look forward to the time when I can see some of you in person. This is a, a, the third time I'm sharing with the congregation, and, and I like it. I really appreciate the worship. Glenn, you lift me up uh, to a higher place during the worship, uh, which doesn't usually happen for me during uh, when I'm zooming in on a call. Uh, so thank you for that and, and uh, just for the beautiful worship uh, that's so appropriate uh, for the, the times and the seasons. Um, and it's uh, just an opportunity to, to be with you. Yeah, we uh, moved over about 30 years ago to uh, to Israel, uh, raised our children there and ministering up in uh, Naharia, which is about uh, six miles from Lebanon. We have our service on Saturday morning, but it's too early for me to participate. I'd have to get up at three o'clock in the morning uh, to join them. So I usually take a pass on the Saturday service but we have a Wednesday uh, uh, evening uh, prayer and, and uh, study time, and I participate in that. And look forward to being back uh, home uh, next month uh, with the congregation. But um, in the true spirit of Sukkot, uh, I am uh, a temporary uh, a sojourner apart from my home. You know, during Sukkot, according to the scriptures, we're supposed to leave our home build the tent, and uh, stay there, be there for a week. So I guess uh, our place here in Philadelphia area, Downingtown, is my sukkah, uh, a temporary dwelling. Um, but, you know, this time of year in Israel is really quite a phenomenal time. Uh, I love the pictures that people post of how some of the uh, Orthodox, the Hasidim, uh, build sukkot on their porches. Uh, and they're kind of sticking out this way and that way, architectural nightmares. Um, but everybody trying to get their sukkah up uh, for uh, the holidays. And, uh, you know, the other beautiful thing, especially this season, is uh, over the last 40 years, um, believers from the nations have con come up to Jerusalem uh, for worship at Sukkot. I think the International Christian Embassy has helped sponsor that. And uh, they're getting you know, tens of thousands of people. And uh, obviously, the last uh, two and a half years for, with COVID, uh, they haven't had uh, a Sukkot celebration. And uh, this year, it looks like it's in full force. And uh, the song we sang in the beginning, Come, let us go up to the mountain of our God, uh, Isaiah Chapter 39, Isaiah says, this is not just for Israel to go up to worship, but that the nations will go up to worship the Lord. Um, and uh, they had a parade uh, the other day, the parade of the nations, where thousands of Christians from all around the world, people dressed in their ceremonial uh, garb, whether it's Africa or, the, or Asia, uh, worshiping the Lord. And uh, just a phenomenal experience. If anybody has a chance in the future to participate at Sukkot. I strongly recommend it. Uh, it's an experience of a lifetime um, and uh, just a time to worship the Lord. And the Israelis look at this and they say, ah, is a is a shigayon. you know what? <laughs> they can't understand why all these thousands of Gentiles come up to Jerusalem uh, for uh, Sukkot. Um, and when you hear it, it's because they love Israel and they love uh, the Lord God. Israelis uh, are a little confused, but better they come up praising God uh, than uh, coming up uh, in other ways. And by way of contrast, this past week in Israel for the Jewish community was a time of celebration at Sukkot. Um, 
and uh, I think on Tuesday they had what's called the Birkata Kohanim, the blessing of the priests, where anybody who's uh, from a Kohen or Levite uh, background, I don't know if Glenn uh, sent an emissary there as a Khan uh, to go up to uh, Jerusalem. So they had thousands of uh, Jewish people at the Kotel for the blessing of the priests, the Kohanim. But on the other side of Jerusalem, there was rioting. Um, this week, uh, pol an Israeli policewoman and a soldier were uh, shot to death by terrorists in Israel. There was rioting and uh, pipe bombs thrown at police in East Jerusalem. Um, you know, and you know the picture of the joy that the Jewish people are experiencing, the anger and frustration that uh, these Palestinian Arabs are ex expressing is just heartbreaking. Um, and uh, we, we do need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, and as somebody reminded me, we're praying for the inhabitants of Jerusalem who are Jews and Arabs, uh, many Arabs who live at peace with Israel, but also Arabs who uh, are very angry uh, and uh, you know, feeling a lot of suffering. But these are the pictures of Jerusalem. But in spite of it all, the rabbis say this is a time of rejoicing. Zman Simchatenu. Um, and uh, during uh, Sukkot, you to remember or have a presence of the four trees, as recorded in Exodus, the Etz Hadar, uh, which is a magnificent flourishing tree, the Etz Tmarim, which is the date palm, the Etz Avot. Um, is a thick tree uh, like a myrtle and the uh, avre nachal, which is a willow. And since you can't bring a tree into your home or even to the, the, the Beit Knesset or the, the Jewish tradition is to represent the festival by four fruits. Um, the first fruit is the etrog or a citron or a big uh, lemon. Um, it's interesting, uh, one time I, I saw in, actually in Brooklyn, uh, Chabad was selling uh, the, uh, the etrogim, and I asked him, uh, I just assumed it was from Israel, and this, this, uh, this Chabad guy said, no, 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 we, we only sell perfect etrogim from Italy. He says, Italy has the best uh, etrogs, and I, I said, man, that doesn't sound good for business in Israel, if the best uh, lemons you can get are from Italy, but uh, nevertheless, in Brooklyn, you can get good Italian lemons, but I'm sure you could go to uh, Borough, uh, you should go to one of the Jewish neighborhoods or Mulberry, down on Mulberry Street, and pick up a good Italian etrog for half the price. The other fr uh, fruit that you bring is the lulav, the palm fronds from the uh, date tree. Uh, then you have the hadas which is the uh, leaves from the uh, myrtle tree, and then the arve, which is the uh, branches from a willow tree. Um, I always enjoy when I'm back in uh, Naharia negotiating for these, you know, because you're supposed to uh, get a, the best one, uh, and they save that for people, Hasidim, who really know, and you pick through the palm fronds and the etrog looking for defect, and you put it aside, uh, and it's 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 an experience. Um, expensive, uh, you know, to get the whole set could cost about 150 shekels, you know, which is about 35 dollars. But I'm sure for New York, it's probably about 50 dollars. I don't know if that went up in in price with inflation. But the rabbis, of course, teach about these, and they say everybody is like one of the four fruits: the etrog, the lulav, the hadas, or the arve. Um, uh, representing different st st situations in life uh, and uh, different status. And I, I find that a very interesting aspect of uh, Sukkot. Another interesting aspect of Sukkot before we get into the message is, um, you know, you're supposed to have your live in the Sukkah, which growing up in uh, the Bronx uh, and in, in North America, obviously, sleeping in a uh, tent a booth was not exactly recommended. I think in the Bronx, if we had slept in the uh, sukkah, you might wind up without your shoes in the morning, somebody having taken them uh, or worse. Uh, but certainly it's pretty chilly outside this time of year. 
So we would settle for having a meal. But according to a Jewish tradition, when you're sitting in the sukkah and you're blessing the food for the meal, you're supposed to invite a spiritual guest. Uh, the tradition is called the Yushpazin. And you would invite Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, Moses, Aaron, uh, David, to come to join you in the tent. Um, and uh, they would impart upon the family blessings and peace. And, and it's a lot of superstition, which I, I wouldn't necessarily hold to, but I like the idea of inviting a guest. And, and uh, you know, we, we sing the song, Come Holy Spirit, Ruach Adonai, come. Um, and, and I think as important as inviting uh, these guests or heroes of the Jewish faith, we need to invite Yeshua to come and dwell with us. Uh, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, he said, uh, he came into us, he dwelt among us. Um, and, and, and this is the abiding presence of the Messiah. And when Yeshua left, he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to teach you and to guide you. And so I think this idea of inviting a guest into the sukkah just reminds me of inviting the Lord uh, to come close to us. And anybody who wouldn't, doesn't know the Messiah, to invite Yeshua, he stands at the entrance to our sukkah and says, I want to come and I want to join you. Um, and, and, and that's some of what I think of when I think of Sukkot. Um, but, but this morning, I want to share with us uh, about uh, John chapter 7, which uh, to me is one of uh, the most interesting and most important uh, chapters in the Gospels. And it's certainly one, it's, it's a Sukkot chapter. Uh, the whole chapter is dealing with the uh, experiences and the callings and the traditions relating to Sukkot. Um, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a worthwhile study. And included in the study are a number of different lessons. And some of it I'll go over briefly. And some of it will go out with a little more... Um, depth. And just for the sake of uh, the study, I want to post uh, this, um, the verse. Um, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the work you're doing. Now, uh, it obviously marks the time that it's the Feast of Booths. It's Shavuot. Uh, the account of his brothers uh, marking the season, marking the tradition of going up to uh, Yerushalayim, all gives incredible uh, credibility to the text. You know, the critics of the New Testament say, it was written 100 years later, you know, and that this wasn't John the Apostle. And, and I say that's it's, it's just not valid to dismiss the writings of John. And especially when you see this kind of detail that would not have been known to uh, non-Jews uh, 200, 300 years later. Um, you know, also a comment I have to make is... Uh, so people have brought the New Testament and the Gospel of John into criticism because he uses the phrase, the Jews, uh, the Jews. Um, and they said this is, a, a is anti-Semitic. Well, first, as a Jew referring to his people, because the readers of the New Testament, when he wrote it, were not necessarily going to be Jewish, he's making an emphasis. But in light of the conflict in this chapter, he's making another point. John was from Galilee, and you could see Jesus went about in Galilee, and that comes up. There's a geographic thing that we'll look in on. Um, and Galilee was the, the place of the nations. Judea, Jerusalem, was the place of the Jewish uh, leaders, uh, as it were, the aristocrats. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But now he's not making anti-Semitic. He's saying he's going up to Judea. 
in verse one, he already says Yeshua is from Galilee. He's going up to Judea where he's not welcome. Judea and Jews is the same word, right? To all you Hebrew uh, three, third level uh, scholars, uh, it's Yehudi, Yehuda. Yehuda is Judea. Yehudi is the person. So it's not as uh, awkward as it seems. And he says it's time to go up. Well, according to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Jews had to go up to the temple uh, or to the place of worship three times a year. Pesach, uh, Shavuot, Pentecost, uh, or and Sukkot. Um, so there's a, an issue here because Yeshua had to go up to Yerushalayim. Uh, he would keep the law of Moses. Um, but his brothers are setting up a scenario that you have to go up and you have to prove yourself if you really are who you say you are. Um, because there's a lot of doubt whether his brothers really believed that he was Mashiach. Um, so they say to him, go up. And in verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. And Yeshua said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that work, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to the feast, for my time has not fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. An interesting point in verse 6, when he says, my time has not yet come, uh, he's using a phrase, he's talking about the appointed time and season. You know, it's not like we look at our clock and say, yeah, it's a quarter to six. I got five more minutes. Uh, he's talking about destiny. He's talking about God's appointed time. Uh, the Messiah came into the world at God's appointed time. Yeshua knew that he was not going to die until God's appointed time, which turned out to be Pesach. And so Yeshua is saying the appointed time uh, for me to come and present myself which I think he knew would end in his death and resurrection, that time has not yet come. So he's speaking of a sacred time as the festivals of Israel were a sacred time. And he says, it's not yet my time. You know, you can't hurry God's clock. Uh, you know, there used to be an old song, you know, you can't hurry love, you just have to wait. Uh, but you can't hurry God's time and uh, we, we see this, and I've seen this over the years as a believer, uh, how people uh, try to predict the times and seasons. Um, I even once heard, yeah, this is about almost 50 years ago, that they were quarrying stone in Indiana to be prepared to build the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and somehow people behind this rumor thought that quarrying stone, getting it ready would help the temple be built quicker. Uh, but that's a whole other issue. Um, we can't hurry the timetable of God. Yeshua says, no man knows the hour or time when I'll return. Um, we know it's coming. We see signs and seasons, but we don't know the appointed time. And so this is what Yeshua is saying, you know, here uh, to his brothers, uh, that it's not yet God's time. But wait. And then we see down in verse 14, and again, the whole chapter is really worth reading carefully and, and dissecting it. He says, about the middle of the feast, uh, which is about now, because uh, Sukkot started Sunday evening, and it's seven days, uh, so it's six days. So it's the middle might have been like Thursday or Wednesday, uh, probably relating to a time when sacrifices were offered. Um, about the middle of the feast, Yeshua went up into the temple and he began teaching. You just can't keep this guy quiet. Uh, he said, they're not going to receive my teaching. Um, his brother said, come up and teach. Uh, and he said, not on your time, but on God's time. So he gets to Yerushalayim and he begins teaching. And the Jews, again, this wouldn't be the Jewish people. The Jews would be the leaders uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, the Sanhedrin, the Kohanim, uh, and the Pharisees, the Ferushim. You got it? It's not an anti-Semitic slur. It's a regional slur. 
or not even slur, but designation, the way you talk about the people, those people in Washington. You know, you know you're not talking about apple pickers in Washington state, right? Those people in Washington, you're talking about the politicians in Washington, D.C., and the officials and the government offices that are run. And it doesn't always have to be a derogatory negative thing. Uh, it could be done with respect or uh, appreciation. Um, and so that's who Yeshua, and he says when they, he taught, they marvel at his teaching, saying, how is this man... Uh, how is it that this man has learning when he never studied? Um, you know, and this gets into a very interesting point. If anyone, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking my own authority. The one who speaks of his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there's no falsehood. So the issue they raise at this point is not the content of Yeshua's teaching, but the qualifications of the teacher. And when they say he's not, how does he know these things? He's never learned, he never studied. One giveaway, and we picked this up in the book of Acts, he spoke with an accent. He had a Galilean accent. Later in the book of Acts, they say to Peter, you're from Galilee, we can tell by your accent. And Basically, it was a hick from the sticks. The same way we have a prejudice when you hear somebody talk with a heavy southern accent. Hi, y'all. Well, I'm all coming back here. Well, last week I was in Dallas, and uh, I did the best to make respectful southern accent, saying shalom, y'all. How y'all, y'all, y'all uh, wanted to be accepted. But I know as, as a New Yorker in particular, you know, hearing a heavy southern accent, you just had a, a, a stereotype you know, uh, of the people, um, that's not appropriate, but we, we had it. And this is the same thing, they hear his accent, and there were no great yeshivas in the Galilee. The yeshivot were in uh, Brooklyn at that time. I mean, Jerusalem. <laughs> you, you should hear Hasidim today talk about where they study. And uh, the, the yeshivas uh, in Brooklyn are the best. But then you talk to people in Lakewood, New Jersey. No, our yeshivas are the best. And then you talk to somebody in uh, Yerushalayim, and they say, no, our yeshivas are the best. Um, and, and that was the discussion. Um, there were no great yeshivas, no famous rabbis who were teaching in Galilee. Um, so the authority you had came from who you studied with. And remember Paul, when he's challenged, what does he, what do we learn about him, him in uh, I think book in the Galatians? He says, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I studied with Gamaliel. You know, and we see this in the book of Acts. Why does Paul tell us that? Because he wants to give him credibility to the religious Jewish people, uh, since he didn't grow up in the land of Israel. His credibility was that he had studied with Gamaliel. Um, Yeshua is a product of the land. Stamped on him was made in Galilee. Um, and that was his, his backing. He didn't need a certificate from a yeshiva or from Gamaliel or other rabbis. In fact, the only rabbi who acknowledged him was Nicodemus, who was part of the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus came to him when? In the middle of the night uh, to, to speak with him uh, so as not to attract attention. But the argument becomes one of training, degree, and authority. And Yeshua says, my authority, my teaching is not from you. It's not from this world. It's from the Father. Um, and we need to remember that. that. There's no less logic, there's no less intelligent or wisdom in the teaching of Yeshua um, because he didn't go to Yeshiva. Uh, but as the Messiah, as a prophet, as a priest, and as a king, he spoke 
in full authority and wisdom and power. And he says, this is who I am. Um, and, and then he goes on here in the text, it goes on to tell us, the crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill, who, who is seeking to kill you? Because Jesus said, you're trying to kill me. And Jesus answered, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, uh, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise on Shabbat. Um, so this was a continuing argument from before where Yeshua healed on Shabbat and the, the leaders were looking to put him to death for violating the Shabbat, which is a whole other issue. But the idea that when Yeshua says they're trying to kill me, and the people say, you, you must have a demon. You're meshugana. Um, this is often the case I found when sharing with uh, other Jewish people, especially religious Jewish people, and telling them Yeshua is the Messiah. Their reaction is, you're crazy. Uh, years ago, when the, as the Messianic movement and the Jesus movement was gaining momentum in the 70s, uh, more than once when a Jewish person I knew accepted Yeshua, the parents would send them to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and the rabbi to, to make sure, that, you know, because the thought was how could uh, a, an intelligent, normal Jewish person believe in Yeshua? And I don't know if that was anybody's experience. Uh, it wasn't mine because everybody thought I was crazy before I believed in Yeshua. And they just figured, okay. Uh, this continues. Um, you know, when I became a believer and I went back to college, my parents were shocked when I went and got a full-time job and cut my hair and cleaned up. Uh, my parents were, uh, you know, stupefied when I got back and got a job working at a hospital. My parents were like, wow, you're almost a doctor now. You're wearing a lab coat instead of torn jeans. Um, it was a transformation, but but I think we know this idea that they're saying you you must be crazy you must have a demon uh because uh what you're saying doesn't add up to what our experience is but the fact is if you read in the gospels they were trying to kill jesus for violating the shabbat and his argument wasn't full with talmudic quotes uh or from other rabbis his argument was from logic that you can heal a man on Shabbat. Uh, it was not doing work. Um, and so the argument gets heated up. And just for the sake of time, we'll move on. Um, you know, but again, you know, it's it, the chapter ends with the confrontation, and it's worth reading through it because they're made the leaders, the rabbis are making accusations against Yeshua, and he's responding with scripture and with logic, uh, and he's not quoting rabbinic sources. And uh, if you work it out, maybe have a friend, you know, split the dialogue, you can see the logic of the argument. But now we come to what I want to focus the rest of the time on, uh, it's a, because it, it takes on a different, in the midst of all of this conflict, there's still time for the prophetic ministry of Yeshua. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Hoshana Rabbah, Yeshua stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures say, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those he believed in were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was glorified, to be glorified. Um, the rabbis teach in the Talmud that he who has not seen the joy of the water drawing has not seen joy in his life. The ceremony of the water drawing was a joyful highlight. The Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of the festival, will be, I think, uh, this Sunday. Um, and then Monday is Simchat Torah, which is kind of an additive. And so today we celebrate this joy, not through the water drawing ceremony, but through the reading of the Torah the completing of the cycle, and then Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. So the rabbis have replaced the last sacrifices and the water. But, you know, in 
uh, Israel this time of year, it's hot, it's dry, and you're waiting for the first rains. And so here's a water drawing ceremony where they took the water out of the temple and poured it out into the, uh, the valley. And then they went down to the pools of Shiloh, filled up the, the, the jars of water, brought it up to the temple. So this is a, a ceremony and they're probably singing and blowing trumpets while they're doing it. But the sidelight is people are thirsty. You know, celebrating a water ceremony at the end of the desert dry season, uh, all you could think about is water. And in the Middle East, water is life. And so they're thinking about this ceremony and they're thirsty and they're seeing the water. Maybe when the pictures are coming up, water is bound dropping out of it as they, they're carrying them up the hill. And Yeshua reads into the hearts and minds of people. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow livers of living waters. And in Isaiah chapter 43, and uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8, uh, there's a prophetic vision of the waters flowing uh, into Israel and God pouring his waters out upon the hearts of the people. Um, and this is the hope that Yeshua gives on this last day of, for the festival. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Um, And we come to him thirsty, dry, needy. Um, and he says, out of you can flow rivers of living water. Um, and, and this is his hope that he leaves with all who would come to him. That he would replenish. He would give us life. Uh, our life wouldn't be like a dry, parched ground, but it would be like a flowing stream. Uh, and living waters. Um, and so when we think of the living waters uh, that Yeshua gives, we think of how he provides. And one of my hike, my, my hobbies, my love of life is hiking. I've hiked all over Israel on the Israel Trail. And now that I'm spending a little extended time in uh, the US and Pennsylvania, I'm hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Well, about, about a month ago, I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail, and it's been a pretty dry season in uh, uh, summer in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, it's been hot. And I'm hiking on the Appalachian Trail, and I have a very good app that tells you where water sources are. And, you know, so I took enough water with the thought that I would replenish at a water source. Well, you know, not living in the area and keeping up on things, I didn't know that the local streams and creeks that flow through this part were dry. And it was a very strenuous hike and a very hot day. And I'm like totally schwitzed. And I get to my campsite and on my app, it says there are water sources. And I had the water planned just to have enough water for dinner and a little water for the morning, and then I would be replenished. And I get to the site, and I start trawling, following the map of where the water sources are. One source dry, second source dry. And I'm schwitzing while I'm walking around looking for more water. And I say, but I have to find the water. And I get to the third water source, dry. And I go back to the campsite, nobody else was there. And I say, oh, boy, boy, I'm in trouble because tomorrow I have to walk about eight miles, 10 miles to uh, the next water source. And, uh, you know, I barely have a, a quart of water. And I'm really beginning to worry. And while I'm looking for the water, I pray, Lord, send me a water angel. On these hiking trails are trail angels, people who bring food and different things to people. And I say, Lord, send me a water angel. And I get back to the campsite and I'm figuring how I can conserve water and make, make dinner. And I'm conserving my water and I eat my dinner. And all of a sudden these two guys come to the campsite 
And they're making all kinds of noise. They're saying there's snakes, there's problems here. And they say, we're not going to sleep here. It's not safe. But I, I was pretty content that I was going to sleep there. And just as they get ready to leave, they say, do you need anything? And I said, I need water. And they said, no problem. You know, we can give you uh, at least a quart of water. And they said, a few miles in the direction you're heading tomorrow morning, uh, somebody le left a, a few gallons of water. And I fill up the water. And as these men are walking off, I yell, I remember that I prayed. And I said, you're an answer to prayer. You were the water angels God sent to me today. And, and when they left, I was just rejoicing. I almost wept, uh, but I didn't want to waste the tears uh, that God had provided. Uh, but for me, it wasn't just that one incident of water, but God has provided my whole life walking with Yeshua, the rivers of living water, that the spirit of God in me doesn't get dry or thirsty, and may it not for you. And as we think of Sukkot, uh, what I call the takeaways from it are that it's a, it's, it's, a simchateno. it's a time of celebrating what the Lord has given us, the provisions. Let us be glad and rejoice. The second is the teaching of ministry of Yeshua is from God and not man. We should never feel second class because uh, we didn't study in this school or that school or this yeshiva or that yeshiva. What we have is from Yeshua, and it's the word of God. And the third is that if we come to him thirsty and needy, he provides all we need. And to those of us this day who are coming needy and uh, we need to look to him uh, for that. And may God bless this word to our hearts. And may all who are thirsty come and drink. Amen.